Okay, then, I think we will just start. Um, welcome to everyone who is online already. My name is Katrin Papst. I am the project leader of the international large scale cooperation project called Identity on the Line where seven European countries are working with the long-term consequences of migration processes. And that includes war. And unfortunately, our conference uh, is in a time where we have a new war in Europe. I'm very sure this affects all of us quite seriously. And I hope and think that this conference might contribute to new answers, how to maybe in the future help the migrants and those who are refugees of war. I am very happy to welcome today six speakers, which I will introduce in a second, and I will also give you an overview over the conference. I just want to give you some information about the projects and the partners behind this conference. So, as I said, I'm the project leader of an international collaboration project, but a spin-off of this international project is that we found how important silence is or not communicating what has happened. And we have seen in all seven countries and also in Norway, where I am stationed at the moment, that something happens with the individual, within the families, within the local societies, of course, and for our joint history understanding, if time witnesses do not want or are not able to share what has happened, their personal experiences. In Norway, many museums have worked with this personal narratives, sensitive, taboo-related uh, topics quite for some time, 10, 15 years. And we got the great possibility now in this conference and in a larger project related to this conference to dig deeper into the questions about what is happening exactly with the untold. What is happening to that not communicated? How does it affect these four stages? The individual, within the families, the local societies and our joint history understanding. There are several partners behind this conference and it's the Westbakter Museum in Kristiansand, Norway, where I'm located. It's the Museum for Kyustkultur or Jenreisning Finnmark in Hammerfest in Norway. It's the University of Tromsø, the Arctic University of Tromsø. And we have the Faculty of Communication of the Vilnius University in Lithuania. The whole conference is sponsored and funded by Arts Council Norway and our sincere thanks for that. I will now start to give you a little overview over the next days. Okay, something happened here. Sorry, give me a second. I guess you can see my modus now, my uh, presentation modus. I think we just have to do it like that. Could you see the six speakers? Yes, is it working? Okay, I just want uh, to give you a short overview over the two days. We have six speakers, three today and three the second day. And as you can see, we have tried to make it at the sharp hour. So we are starting now at two with uh, Professor Dr. Thomas Elbert. We have a lecture at three, a lecture at four, and tomorrow at 11, 12, and one o'clock. Today, we will get a first overview about narrative exposure ther the therapy by Thomas. I will come back to that. And Maggie Schauer, Dr. Maggie Schauer, will follow up with give us some insights about museum work. How can museums use this therapy with which Thomas is introducing. And then we will get a case study at four o'clock from Canada um, related to settlers genocide in Canada, which you might have heard a lot about in the news. Tomorrow we are following up with Net Facts uh, by Dr. Katie Robiant and then by Paolo, Paolo Fonda, hear a little bit more about the war mindset or the, more, the mind at war, as he calls it. And the last lecture tomorrow at one o'clock will be at, in Norwegian language and about the Sami minorities. So I have said already a little bit about the background of this conference and historians or ethnologists, anthropologists have worked for quite some time now with the sensitive 
topics which normally are not communicated. And we have seen the long-term consequences of these secrets in for many, many years now and are trying now to have a closer look by interviewing three generations of people, time witnesses who have experienced migration or war. In Norway, the new research project, which this conference is related to, is having a closer look at the Second World War when the Germans occupied Norway for five years. And the long-term consequences are still very visible here in the country. There, um, so that is um, our main topic, uh, our main topic uh, here in Norway. And we can see that other fields of study, which we will learn about in this conference, have worked with these topics quite for a long time. Psychologists, neuroscience, epigenetics have a lot to teach us. But until now, historians, anthropologists, and ethnologists have not combined and taken in, of us, taken in the knowledge from these fields of studies. And we hope that this conference will contribute to change that and that the fields of studies will work closer together. We see a lot of possibilities here and we will come back to that. The three questions of this conference are, how and when does intergenerational transfer happen and what exactly is transferred between the generation? Which role plays silence the unspoken? What does this implicate for museums and researchers involved in researching, collection, and disseminating personal narratives about a troubled, unaddressed past? And what is important to have in mind if the goal is to contribute an increased quality of life for the informants and their descendants? For all of you, some practical information. And each lecture will last approximately 35 minutes, and there is enough time for questions afterwards. Please raise your hand. We can see it, and we can give you the floor. You can ask questions. We don't have a video function, but you can ask questions live if you want, or you can use the question and answer session, where, which we will monitor closely. All lectures will be recorded and made available afterwards for all interested. And with that, it is a huge, huge honor and pleasure for me to welcome Professor Dr. Thomas Elbert. He has been since 1995, Thomas, I have uh, your, your bio here on the screen, Professor of Clinical Psychology and Behavioral Neuroscience at the University of Constance where you have worked together and developed the narrative exposure therapy, which we are going to hear more about today, in order to treat traumatic stress syndromes. NET, narrative exposure ther therapy, has also been successfully tested in fields of studies and crisis in regions in Africa and Asia, and we are going to hear tomorrow about the Congo. Your studies on the psychobiology of human readiness for violence and killing have been funded since 2010 by the German Research Foundation as a Reinhard Koselleck project and since 2013 by a ERC advanced grants. I think I stop here. Everyone can find your bio also on the conference page. And I'm looking very much forward to this very first introduction and general overview over international transfer. Thomas, the stage is yours. I would like to welcome everyone with a peace and light in this dark times. Thank you, Katrin, for inviting me to this conference. And thank you for the organizers uh, to allow me to present part of our research now, in this part with a focus on the transgenerational aspects. I hope you can see my screen right now. Yes. Information about what I'm going to present. If you want to read additional information, you can go to this website, vivo.org. <coughs> Okay, what are the troubled experiences that we typically uh, have to deal with? And it's violence, violence, and violence. It's violence domestic, and it's organized violence. And violence is the major driver of suffering uh, of mental disorders, but also uh, 
uh, physical disorders in this world. It uh, results in stress that favors a number of very uh, unpleasant uh, problems, including problems of disease, but also on the societal uh, uh, level. <clears throat> I will explain you why we usually do not talk about these traumatic experiences and why it is worse than the actually horror that people experience is to leave it unspoken. And part of this talk and the subsequent talk by Maggie Schauer will be how can we overcome avoidance and silence? Now the uh, devastating uh, aspects of the stress is not a single stressor, not a single car accident, not a single robbery. It is the continuous threat that is there uh, first by your, the environmental conditions, later on in your mind, when the fear does not go away anymore. <clears throat> if you avoid to talk about it, it increases this continuous threat all the time. Uh, you are activating your defense system all the time. And um, this will um, bear and tear sooner or later change our defense possibilities. And what I will explain in my talk that this affects not only yourself, but also the future generations. Um, we forgot that there is a world of organized violence, <clears throat> um, but uh, it has come clearer, closer to us. Um, organized violence has been ongoing ever since uh, humans um, uh, evolved on this planet. And we have the domestic violence. The adverse childhood experiences that begin um, already early that include the abuse, physical, sexual, emotional, just to give you a figure, 15% of girls, 6% of boys are sexually abused, um, physically abused are about 20% in European societies and emotional abuse and neglect uh, turns out to be as toxic as the physical and sexual abuse. These data um, that we have in the science are very strong. For instance, there is data from 10 million uh, uh, people who have reported the sexual abuse. It's not dependent on the particular socioeconomic status as opposed to physical abuse. But as you know, there are other problems um, right now in our mind is of course war and displacement of people that contribute to permanent stressors. Um, even by continuously uh, degrading, shouting, uh, <clears throat> neglecting a person, uh, you cause permanent stress in these children and later on in the adults. And the stress of course results then in difficulties with your mind, with your mental health. Not only children experience domestic violence, women do too. Um, if I look, um, so this is data from a European survey. This is why I have no data from Sweden, uh, from Norway, but Sweden is close to that. And you see 45% of the interviewed people. And again, we have large numbers report uh, physical, sexual, or emotional abuse by the partner. And the point is that this abuse is not a single experience, it is there all the time. For instance, here we look, have you experienced recently abuse by the partner? Have you uh, intimate partner violence experienced in the past? What we find those who <coughs> report current 
here on this axis, okay, also usually reported in the past. So it's a continuous stressor. And if it's there all the time, post-traumatic stress disorder, depression, other mental problems will evolve. And the social and <clears throat> uh, occupational functioning will decrease. Now, why is that the case that it destroys basically the wellness and the mind of people? And I want to give you an example here of how we form the memories. Assume you are witnessing of an explosion of a bombing in Donetsk 2014. Bombing, shouting, gunfire, a lot of sensory information uh, <clears throat> gets stored in your memory, gets processed. This will cause thoughts that you may die. I can't do not anything. These cognitive processes go <clears throat> in parallel with emotional processes, with the fear that you may die, with the rage, who is doing this? Who is shooting? Uh, who is bombing uh, civilian places here? You get really very angry. There's tremor. There are physiological responses, okay? And this whole information is stored in memory. So when you see now eight years later, again, that houses are bombed, um, these memories will come up and they will again may <clears throat> lead to anger, to fear and to rage. But if it's just the memory that is brought up, if you we, I just show you the pictures eight years later, you're not involved in a strong, you're not producing a strong emotional or cognitive response because you know, this has been eight years ago. It is the repeated experience that forms a associative network uh, that includes the cognitive and emotional responses. By associations, I want to remind you, of course, the memory forms associations all the time. Um, if I say a tool, you probably will say hammer or screwdriver, depending on how your memories have formed about tools. Um, if I say tree, name a tree, you may say oak tree. Okay, there's an association that one element, for instance, oak, will activate another one, maybe um, tree, okay? So you form this memory of a um, <clears throat> very important, uh, very stressing, very stressful event. And when we experience stressful events, these memories particularly strongly formed, okay? Now, if you have experienced not just one such life-threatening, as we call it, traumatic stressor, if you have been also involved in a motorbike accident, and <clears throat> if you have been the victim of your stepfather coming home and beating you as a child, or um, you have been raped when the age of 15 uh, by the neighbor of your aunt in the barn, um, this all creates an associative memory, okay? And the information where and when this has happened gets lost because you can't be at different places. You can't be in Donetsk in 2014 and at your aunt's place in 2012 and uh, at the motorbike accident in 2015, this information, this is how our brain is organized. This information gets lost. It's like uh, we, have, we have a navigator in the brain. Um, like you have in your car, you can have only one cursor. And therefore this information gets lost and you're left with this uh, <clears throat> associative memory. Now, if you see a guy in um, the barn that looks similar, to the one where you experienced the rape, it may activate this whole associative network and you may get fear. And you don't know that this is actually belongs to a past experience any longer. So you're under permanent threat. This is the core of post-traumatic stress disorder. People with post-traumatic stress disorder never have really uh, uh, 
realized what has happened to them in the past and what's an actual threat. This is, they are under permanently, they have a memory that can be triggered all the time and then they get into a, a, a fearful response and strong emotional cognitive changes take place and they're afraid that something terrible will happen in the here and now, even if everything is in the past. Of course, it's even worse when the threat is real and the war continues. So <clears throat> this associative memory comes up during the day in a flashback and you feel that you're back in the situation. My client passes <clears throat> a fire station in our village. It goes a little bit uphill. He is excited. He has more strong heartbeat than usual. He sees a, <clears throat> a fire station, a man in uniform. He thinks he's back in the war and of course um, he, uh, gets a terrible panic and fear. So somebody needs to tell him what you are experiencing right now is not a true threat that is here in the presence. It's a past experience, okay? And this is the core of narrative exposure therapy that Maggie will explain to you in detail in the next talk. These memories come up during the day as flashback. They come up during the night in nightmares. <clears throat> um, and um, uh, a, a, a clear characteristic is that people believe that this is uh, happening to them in the here and now, when actually it's, it's a memory that is coming up. It is so frightening that you don't try to avoid to think of it. So avoidance is a care, is, is a core of PTSD. And many triggers like the fire station, like just a physical exercise, like other emotional activations that will bring up this memory, activate our major defense system, uh, keep that in an alarm state. And this major defense system is called HPA axis because it goes from the hypothalamus that releases a hormone called corticotropic releases hormone that goes to the pituitary gland here uh, at the base of the brain. And that releases ACTH, another uh, <coughs> messenger that goes to the adrenal glands and those adrenal glands release cortisol. And cortisol changes everything. It changes how our brain functions. It changes how our immune system functions. It prepares the body for fight and flight. That is good for a temporary change. When the danger is over, the stress response should be shut down. And we have receptors in different stages in the brain, in the pituitary gland that shuts down this response. If you're in, uh, activated again and again, you keep this HPA axis going. When it functions properly, that you activate it to a particular stressor, it helps us to deal with crisis. But if it's activated all the time, <clears throat> uh, then it may get in a high cycling mode and the result can be anything from uh, cold to depression, um, tense uh, muscular responses result in headache in most of our clients. It can be the other way around that the, the consequences is a flattening of the response and then you have other um, unwanted consequences. So the victims of violence, domestic or organized, have an increase for mental ill health. They are more likely to become anxious, depressed. Suicidality increases. People with a good childhood are not very likely to become suicidal. It's only those stressed during their childhood. And you have the, <clears throat> you have the um, uh, typical uh, disorders that we call disorders of civilization, uh, but in fact, they are related to these stresses. 
we can measure uh, the detectors of the cortisol uh, in the body. These are uh, glucocorticoid receptors. These are receptors. And we can see that if you have never experienced a traumatic stress, you have many of those receptors that help you stop your stress response. If you have PTSD, <clears throat> there's many threats that come up from the memory uh, that you have experienced. You reduce it and keep, this keeps changes your HPA axis. That means your gene expression, what you read from your genes has changed. You don't read these receptors any longer. They are coded in the DNA of your genes and you don't read this part any longer. Why don't you read this any longer? Because you put a chemical marker on the DNA that this part should not be read. It's actually a methylation group that you have put to one of these uh, letters of our genetic code, and then you're no more reading it, okay? So it can modify what you read uh, of the genetic code. You all know that a caterpillar and a butterfly have exactly the same genetic code. It's the same animal, just it evolves, it ages, okay? But this butterfly obviously reads a different part of the genetic code than the caterpillar. This is because it modifies the readability of the genome with different mechanisms. In humans, we can, for instance, from a drop of saliva, measure what kinds of genes are currently read in this person. And by this information, I can tell you how old you are within a couple of years. And as we see, Cross, as you all know, as you get older, you read different parts of your gene. And this process starts already during pregnancy. And now comes the decisive part that this HPA axis modifies this readability of the genes. The cortisol of the mother goes through the placenta and affects the HPA axis of the child. And this modifies the readability of the child's developmental, uh, um, uh, of the child's development, okay? So the mother not only gives the genetic code to the child, it also tells the child what to read. Now, what, why does that make sense? Well, the mother will tell the child, listen, you come to a certain environment and I have to prepare you for an environment where there is a lot of violence, where there is war, or it's a peaceful environment. So you have to modify your HPA axis in a different way. And this is what we see. Uh, for instance, we can investigate <clears throat> women during pregnancy uh, who have developed, who have experienced during pregnancy intimate partner violence. And then we see that their readability of change has changed. Not if they experience, experience it before pregnancy or after pregnancy, but during pregnancy, the child uh, is pushed into an altered de developmental path. Okay, uh, adversive childhood experiences with together with this pre-programming of the mother act together to produce an adaptive or a maladaptive response. In our society, for instance, the response will maladaptive with more borderline symptoms. Now, we go with Fernanda Zepiloni, Simone Assis and others to the favelas of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, there are high levels of interpersonal violence and there is uh, high stressors and a great variation in stressor. So we have basically a quasi experimental situation of the stress. And we investigate the mental health of the grandmother. And we look what kind of threatening experiences she had. And we look at the <clears throat> mental health of the mother and at the child, okay? And we document what have they experienced? And what we see is <clears throat> that 
in the offspring, the readability of genes has changed depending on the stress of the mother and even on the stress of the grandmother. And this may cause more externalizing problems. <clears throat> this may, however, also reduce the depression. So the mother is programming the child to change um, its behavior and its phenotype in a corresponding environment. And if we look more closely, the change is massive. It's a uh, from monkey studies, we know it concerns about 6,000 of the 30,000 genes we have. Uh, and it changes, of course, the monkey will not have an, an additional uh, toe or another arm, neither do humans. It changes our brain and our immune system, our regulatory system, and many uh, places uh, that are altered. I don't want to show you all the details and difficulties. It's quite a complicated science. I just show you this slide to confuse you. You have to look at many aspects um, and you come up with a, a summary here. <clears throat> if mothers are exposed to intimate partner violence, um, <clears throat> they will of course um, present with depression, PTSD and children <clears throat> will have similar psychiatric problems when exposed to this domestic violence once they are born. Now the surprising finding that we have is that if the mother is exposed to a violent environment during pregnancy, it will somehow change the phenotype of the child so that it gets adopted to uh, a stressful and violent environment. This is actually happening in nature. Um, here is one example of Daphnia crustaceans, little, <laughs> we call them Wasserflühe in German, uh, uh, <clears throat> little creatures um, that when their mother has experienced stress by predators will behave differently. They will stay in the dark during the day and go up and try to get food during the night. If their mother has not been exposed to predators, they will just behave in the opposite way. So the, even that Daphnia tells through the eggs, okay, have a different behavior and even <laughs> have developed spikes and helmets in this environment. In a similar way, humans change the phenotype uh, <clears throat> when they are of the, of the offsprings, when they are adapted to the violence. However, this is not adaptive in a peaceful environment. It actually fuels the cycle of violence. It causes in, a, in these children more autistic behavior. It causes more disease, particularly uh, not adaptive in peaceful environments. And just to complete it, not only the <clears throat> mother affects the child, but the grandmother affects also the germline of where the later on the grandchild develops. And it's probably the same, it's so probably also true, at least from animal studies, what we know that also um, fathers have an, infect, an effect on the readability of genes in the their offsprings. The genes that we found are linked to the circular system to burst effects, but also to depression and PTSD in the grandchild. So what we see is that trauma, violence through the partner or in the environment causes stress. That stress may cause PTSD, the inability to locate, to, to, <clears throat> to say when actually the stresses um, when and where they happen and what is a current danger or not. So it increases the permanent perception of stress. This changes the readability of genes and together of course with the parenting, it alters the mental health and the physical health of the offspring. 
So prenatal interpersonal violence is associated with differentially methylated DNA with different readability of the genes. <clears throat> and um, yeah, in a way, the mother changes the child, even the grandmother changes the child. Now, what can we do to break the cycle of adaptation to violent environments, which in turn, as we know from other studies, causes more violent behavior in the offspring. And <clears throat> the answer is reduce the stress by reducing PTSD. PTSD means I'm under current threat, even though it's not true, and means I'm avoiding it because it makes me fear to mention it. It, the avoidance, the unspoken, uh, maintains the PTSD. So you have to put this in words, and this will be the next presentation by Maggie Schauer to reduce the narrative exposure therapy. Um, and we cannot treat all the people. We need to make it public. We need to overcome the collective avoidance. This will, Katie Robchand will uh, talk about this aspect. And um, to the people, <clears throat> to the historicians among you, I um, may emphasize what you know already, that humans are not built like your textbooks. They are not uh, documenting, memory, uh, memorizing in detail the past experiences. More like a Janus face, they learn from the past and look into the future. Evolution has given us a memory so that we um, adapt to the future and not that we record the past. This is the task of the historians and of the museums to record, to document the past in the proper way. Individuals have limited abilities to do this. And in order to document the atrocities, what has happened, the human rights violations, in order to put this unspoken into words, you will help the society at large. I think um, my science clearly proves that this is the case. The question is only to what extent can we reach the people at large? Well, at this point, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. I have a last slide. Don't forget, this is not the way to create peace with 6,000 nukes in Russia and 5,000 to create even more, okay? No, the road to peace is this one. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas, for this presentation. I'm not sure I liked your like sli last slide because as uh, many others, I'm trying to forget the many nuclear weapons which we have in the world at the moment. And as we know, it doesn't help to just suppress memory. So thank you very much for your presentation. We open the floor for questions uh, from all of you. So you can raise your hand or you can ask in the question the Q&R code. While we are waiting for the first questions to come in, I have some questions to your presentation, Thomas. Um, you're a German, I am a German, and uh, we know that it's the first uh, war in Europe since the Second World War, what we see in Germany. And the messages I receive from my um, family in Germany is that the generation who has experienced trauma and stress during the Second World War, those who were kids then and are adults today, 80, around 80 years old, they experience the pictures they see in the newspaper, not the newspapers, but on TV, the live pictures, almost as re-traumatizing. Could you, and, and there are almost, or there are messages on TV that you, if you can, you have to share the memories who come up, but many people do not know how because they have never talked about it. Can you see? Can you say a little bit about what your first impressions of the last weeks are when it comes to maybe a re-traumatizing through the pictures we see from the Ukraine now? 
Well, the trauma, as I said before, a traumatic stressor we define as something that is life-threatening, okay? Uh, it's not important whether it is really threatening you or not. It's important whether you perceive it as threatening, okay? So if your house shakes a little bit because a truck goes by and you realize it's a truck, no threat. If you think it's a major earthquake coming up, you'll be, even though not true, you will respond, of course, uh, this will be a threat. And the question is, are pictures perceived as a threat or are they perceived as, yeah, this is happening at a remote place, at other time, other location, and I'm not under threat. And this is how do you connect it to your previous experiences? And if you think the war will come to Europe, to Western Europe, actually it's in Europe, it will come to Western Europe. You can have, you can traumatize people, definitely. So actually um, those who uh, present this information should continue to emphasize uh, who is actually under threat and who is not. And those who are under threat, of course, have not to neglect, must not neglect the threat. I mean, they have to see how they can cope with the situation. But us in Germany, we are, uh, well, we, we have to very be clear, what are the chances, okay? What are the, <laughs> two weeks ago, I thought the chances for anything like an atomic uh, 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 war are zero. It's more likely that I uh, have a traffic accidents or uh, uh, whatever, catch a disease. Um, now that has changed a little bit, but we should um, uh, be well aware of what the real dangers are. And um, I think Germans, uh, at least my generation, I've been born after World War II, but we have, my generation realized how terrible World War II was. And this is um, in our memory. It's part of our associative memory. Um, the Holocaust is part of our memory and it's part of our collective um, uh, depth and um, to some extent, uh, collective pain. I mean, some people have called it the German angst. I think it results from this uh, potential uh, of a new wars, so that new wars may happen. Um, and therefore we have to very clearly differentiate what are actual threats, what are threats that we connect with experiences from the past and does it make sense to connect it or not? Thank you for that answer. I am, when I'm listening uh, again from, to news from Germany, I have the impression that it is very difficult for many people to, to separate or to understand that this is as you see, this is a say it's a real threat that something might happen. And it's difficult to differentiate, okay, this happened 77 years ago, and this might happen again. These are two different things, but somehow the same. So many people go, as I understood, in a kind of the war is back, and they are somewhere in the middle of what has happened then and memories which they know somehow are related to a long time ago, but somehow they are triggered again by the pictures you see as of they are happening now. And is there anything you would uh, suggest one could do if you have parents, grandparents, we see the same in Norway, we see the same in other countries, it's not only in Germany, of course, people who have experienced the war now as children, as the most of the time witnesses who have been adults, doesn't live anymore. Is there any advice from you to the people who are close this generation? Should we ask that they share their memories to put what happened then in the past? Or should, because there is a real new threat as well. So how, how would you suggest we museums who work with informants who have experienced the war, but also we as maybe daughters or sons or grandchildren of those who have experienced the war should address our relatives or informants when they share traumatic memories? Yeah, I think there is no um, simple answer to your question. Um, it depends. There are people who have experienced the World War II in Germany. I know some of them uh, as children, but they have, uh, uh, for instance, um, <clears throat> uh, I know someone who has seen the, from the far away as a child, the bombing of Munich. Um, it was like a firework she was never really 
very afraid because as a child, she didn't realize that these bombs could actually even hit her or so. At that time, it was very unlikely. Now, for those people, I think they seem to be more relaxed. They say, okay, we have overcome the war. It is terrible. It should not happen again. But we don't go and collect um, uh, bread uh, and store it in our cellar. That doesn't make sense. Okay? But then there are those people who have suffered who have um, suffered during the war because they were the house was bombed, they had to flee. Uh, they were uh, had experienced a lot of atrocities, and these memories then may come up again. And because they have never really talked about it, um, I have um, we have worked with uh, elderly people who um, have experienced the war and who have been as soldiers or as uh, just women who fled the war and who were raped uh, and had other uh, terrible experiences, they have never talked about it. The majority of German uh, women who have been raped in the war have never ever talked about it and have lived with it. And this unspoken now comes up in their mind and they connect it whether they want it or not. So for them, it, it helps to tell, okay, what happened then and what is the threat now, okay? And then I was uh, <clears throat> I mean, uh, raped by a Russian soldier. That it will happen now is basically the likelihood, I would say, is zero, okay? It's not to be connected. Um, and other experiences as well, of course, they have to be, um, separated, um, that is very important. So talk about what is, um, what are you afraid of and why are you afraid of? And is this rational and does it, is it, uh, do you make your links to the past? Uh, and are these links rational? Some of them are, yes. I mean, the experience that humans can be uh, very, uh, Criminal um, terrorists, yes, they can. I've, I've experienced that. That's even worse, but um, uh, okay, this can happen. Um, and uh, what is um, um, what is so? What's the real threat, and what comes from the past? And then, if you say the real threat is that there is that the war will come to Germany or Poland or whatever, then of course you respond to that. That helps too. Okay, how can I? Um, try to reduce the danger, how can I help others? How, how can I protect myself? A very reasonable um, response in this case. But again, don't mix your own personal experiences. And it's this associative fear network that I tried to briefly sketch, not only connects the current threats of war uh, with previous war, it connects with every other terrible experiences connects with um, your traffic accident. It connects with uh, uh, the problems you had during your upbringing, okay? Mm -hmm. You got beaten. So the body position you got beaten then, <clears throat> if you're in the same body position now, you make this, your memory gets activated and you have to clearly separate what is the past and what is happening in the present. Thank you, uh, Thomas. I have some more questions, but we have now luckily a question in the Q&A because it's not only supposed to be a, a chat between the two of us. So please, all of you, um, place your questions now. We have only a few more minutes. And we have a question, uh, Thomas. Can national tensions also pass through generations? So I think we are talking about collective trauma or collective memory here. So can uh, national tensions... Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, a very good question, but I think there are many people in this audience who can answer this uh, from their historical knowledge much better than I. Uh, I, I recall the war in the Kosovo, Maggie has worked in the Kosovo, the next speaker, um, and uh, so we have uh, some information from there. Um, we had not, you know, I... I had uh, at that time uh, building my house, I had one, per one person from Serbia and one from Croatia and they were working together. We were friends, they were smoking cigarettes together and all of a sudden, you know, they were enemies. Um, so 
<laughs> it, it is the past that tells us the Balkans that uh, it comes up again. And uh, of course, uh, the, the Russians now uh, justify their war also with um, historical uh, arguments that are, of course, uh, ridiculous in a way, but uh, um, um, this is something that um, uh, is, is very, uh, is part of the um, uh, consciousness of, of a nation, of the builds a nation, builds the um, uh, tradition. Um, <clears throat> um, another speaker in your conference just comes to my mind, Katie Robson has done narrative exposure therapy with native Indians. And they have started there to, to document their stresses and traumatic experiences, not during their own life, but in during their ancestors' life. And they have woven it into their uh, uh, shirts that, you know, this is, has started there and then. And uh, also work in African countries, in villages, typically these people would not start with the last famine, but with a famine a hundred years ago. So that's very strongly, I mind. Mean, we as humans are, uh, have this memory and we have the collective memory and we built it in there. And you and I as Germans, we behave differently because of history. Okay. Thomas, we have one more question here, which is related to what we are talking about. Um, as I said in the introduction, in Norway, we are working with this three generational perspective. And that is because you can talk to all three generations. And you have talked now, both in your talk and also in your last answer, about the generational transfer of trauma, which can go longer to back. So we get this nice question, which is, uh, I think, not easy to answer. How many generations uh, back? can affect your present life or our present life. Do we know anything about how long this generational transfer might go on? And if I can add a little challenge to this question, could one say that the stronger the trauma, the longer it will be passed on? Okay, uh, the transgenerational aspect has two mechanisms. One is the biological transformation, okay? The mother to the child and the grandmother to the child. Now there are very clear biological pathways that predict it. Unclear is, so even if you are raised in a different, say by a stepmother, if your mother dies for some reason and you're growing up in a completely different environment, you never have learned to know your mother, she still gives you this information through the epic genetic changes. And um, we have clear documentation that this is at least across two generations. It is unclear whether it's across more generations. Um, uh, I think then it could, should be done in animal experiments to show that this is the case. But uh, for the molecular pathways, we would not really uh, clearly understand how this would happen. So we have, you have the two, generations that are there for, for sure. The grandmother's influence is smaller than mother's influence. I would say it's about the 10 to 20% um, of the impact from the grandmother, okay? And much more from the mother. Um, there's also information by the father um, that is transferred only now we begin to understand that um, uh, the sperm fluid, not just the semen, uh, import information via non-coding RNAs that is transferred. Okay, the other information, of course, that is transferred is by telling the stories. Um, and the question is again, how much avoidance is there? You know, do they ever uh, do? Do your uh, parents and grandparents talk about what has happened? I recall a Jewish uh, uh, person who uh, survived Auschwitz. And she took along uh, as her memory, a spoon. And she asked her children to eat with the spoon every morning, the breakfast. But she never said to them that this spoon is from Auschwitz. She never talked about that. It's the avoidance that doesn't allow them to them. So the unspoken lives on in this family. Something I'd say spooky is there. And uh, this can of course uh, also be transferred across generations. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you, Thomas. And this is what we have seen clearly in this international project that the unspoken can be sensed, of course, by the kids and even by the grandchildren. We have a new question in the chat. Um, and uh, this is from uh, Janes Loga. Um, uh, which professions should be more involved in solving these problems? Of course, you because you're at the conference for historians, you said already historians and ethnologists. So thank you for that. But uh, in general, um, Besides your profession, which professions should be more involved in solving these issues? Whom, who else could contribute? Because, of course, here is, a, here is a, so much to work on and here is so much unspoken trauma which one can, could address. So what would you say? What would, you, which, what would your answer be? Yeah. Okay, I come from a clinical psychological, uh, or if you want, also psychotherapeutic perspective. And there we treat people one-to-one, -one, okay? Now, when we have worked in, in African regions, there are so many people who are traumatized after war, let's say in Southern Sudan or in Eastern Congo or in, in Somalia, that it, and there are, there's one psychiatrist in all of Somalia and I must say he's crazy. So how do you treat these people? And the answer was, we have to train local counselors, uh, local people um, to um, help with it, but that even uh, would not ever, we don't have the resources to cover a large uh, fraction of those survivors who are in need. So we have to go steps further um, beyond that. And um, there we need uh, people outside of the uh, psychotherapeutic uh, domain. We need people who um, know how do I transmit information that is important that I've, with a psychological head, maybe gathered from the survivor, individual survivors, how do I transfer this information to a, a larger audience? So my answer is, we need not just the highly trained psychotherapists, forget them actually, the, not for the, sure for individual treatments, perfect, but for the, problem at large. We need many counselors uh, who deal with the people who help the people who are given the methods, the treatment procedures, intervention strategies to help these people who collect the information, who use them for human rights purposes. We need people um, who are in this field to advance human rights. We need people who know how to transmit information. And this is why we need artists. This is why we have started to work with artists um, in various ways. These, uh, in, in Africa, we had um, people who played, actually the former child soldiers by themselves starting to play theater plays, to create theater plays, to give this information to others. Um, and um, uh, yes, and this is what I think is needed in the, in the future. Um, journalists, um, right now could help, but they are relying on highly emotional reports uh, to catch the attention of the people. That's a psychological trick, that's mean, and that's why I would not rely on them. I, I'd rather rely on people who seriously document history, right? Thomas, uh, thank you very, very much. I think we have come to the end of uh, your presentation. I really appreciate that you have taken the time to be with us and for your very good first insights into a large working field. And of course, I'm happy you said that there are many who can contribute to somehow help the situation we are in when it comes in general to the unspoken and the war, which is going on right now and the people who might experience more. We are